I'll do that. Just recording. Okay, uh, we'll get started. Um, Bismillah Rahim Rahim. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum, brothers and sisters, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Odaris Young, and I'm the president of UNT Dallas College of Law, uh, Muslim Law Student Association, in short, AMOSA. Um, <laughs> today we'll be discussing a very important topic um, regarding Zionism, and we are blessed today to be able to partner with the American Muslims for Palestine for this event. Um, now, this subject matter is the subject matter of Zionism is very broad and encompasses a lot of issues. It would be a disservice to believe that we can cover all aspects of it in one single event. Um, inshallah, we'll have more events and collaborations with AMP to discuss uh, more narrow topics within this important subject matter. Um, so today, our speaker is Dr. Forgive me for butchering if I do it again, Hatim Bazan. Bazian. Bazian, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, he's a Palestinian American and the co-founder of um, American Muslims for Palestine, as well as his chairman. Um, Dr. Bazian is also a professor at UC Berkeley, California. And from the years of 2002 to 2007, he was an adjunct professor at law at Bolt Hall School of Law at the University of California, um, Berkeley. He teaches courses on Islamic law and society. Um, Islam in America, Communities and Institutions, de Deconstructing Islamophobia and Other Aspects of Islam, Religious Studies, as well as Middle Eastern Studies. He has been pivotal in discussing Zionism as a colonial project. Um, and I would suggest you all look into his website and other uh, resources. I will place that in the chat. Um, I won't take any more of your time. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bazian. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. And it's a pleasure to be with you from uh, all the way from California to Texas. And uh, as they say, it's, uh, Texas is a big state, but inshallah, the Zoom will make it close to us. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, try to really cover the topic. Um, and then hopefully we'll have as many questions as possible uh, that could arise. So I always say Palestine, it is something colonial. Um, you can't approach Palestine without uh, framing it and understanding it as being a colonial enterprise. Uh, often people try to uh, explain it in all types of uh, uh, distortion as a communication problem, lack of understanding, but it is a colonial issue. If we think about Herzl, uh, the father of political Zionism and modern Israel, uh, he said, I consider the Jewish question, uh, and the Jewish question in terms of uh, Europe at the time, uh, neither a social nor a religious one, even though it sometimes takes these and other forms. Uh, he's framed it as a national question. Uh, he said a question of creating a new nation meaning uh, bringing a nation into existence uh, at a time of the rising tide of nationalism. Uh, he said, where I, sum up, where I to sum up the Basel Congress is one word, which is, I shall guard against pronouncing it publicly. It would be this, at Basel I, I have founded the Jewish state. So uh, this is the uh, direction of political Zionism. Uh, Herzl's uh, personal belief that post-emancipation Jewish efforts at cultural assimilation were uh, destined to fail as a method for addressing anti-Jewish discrimination and violence. Uh, he believed that anti-Semitism stemmed from the fact that everywhere in Europe, uh, Jewish people were treated as outsiders. According to his opinion, only by creating a state where Jewish people predominated politically and demographically could they ever be safe. Uh, his work at the time ca carried enormous weight uh, among Jewish intellectuals, artists, political activists, uh, religious leaders, and the idea of a Jewish return to Palestine uh, was not new. However, Herzl was the first to ever make it e seem possible. Uh, um, before Herzl, many of those who 
called for a return to Palestine uh, actually were Christian theologians, uh, seeing that a return to Palestine is a, one of the preconditions for the second coming of Jesus, uh, which gives us at least to understand in the contemporary period in the US uh, for sure, uh, why many of the evangelicals, including uh, possibly in your uh, neighborhood in Texas, why many of the evangelists uh, support Israel, not because uh, all of a sudden uh, they feel uh, a affinity to the Jewish people or a hatred to Muslims, which both could be possible, but in essence, it's uh, preparing the ground for what they believe is the second coming of uh, Jesus. So Zionism emerges out of European anti-Semitism. And in here, uh, Dr. Leo Pinsker's 1882 statement is telling in terms of uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, he said, quote, for the living, uh, the Jew is a dead man. For the natives, an alien and a vagrant. Uh, for property holders, a beggar. For the poor, an exploiter and a millionaire. Uh, for patriots, a man without a country. For all classes, a hatred rival. A people without a territory is like a man without a shadow, something unnatural, uh, spectral. So he was describing the anti Semitism that was prevalent. Uh, in Europe. So again, what we need is to situate the Zionist project within uh, European uh, racist, uh, Eurocentric uh, discourse. Uh, remember that in 1884, uh, the scramble for Africa by European powers after the Berlin Conference uh, which uh, dehumanize and look at all other non-European white Christians as being subhuman. Uh, so anti-Semitism, European anti-Semitism gives the birth to the idea of uh, Zionism and the idea of a Jewish state. So Zionism, a movement originally for the re-establishment and now the development of a Jewish nation in what is now Israel, and another definition, Zionism is the belief in the existence of a common past and a common future for the Jewish people. Such faith can be accepted or rejected. How it, however, it can be a matter of rational argument only to a very limited expense, extent. So this is in essence, uh, the, uh, those who want to defend and argue for political Zionism, which is creating uh, a Jewish state. And this is only a matter of a 200 year project enterprise to be distinguished from uh, religious Zionism or Judaism, which has a much, much longer history. Uh, but Zionism want to uh, equate and make sure that the link between Zionism and Judaism is an explicit and uh, direct one in such a way that opposing Zionism means you're opposing uh, um, Judaism and as such makes it uh, politically convenient to do so as a way of silencing any critique or debate on the subject. <clears throat> now, Theodore Herzl, the founder of modern political Zionism, he, uh, in a letter to Great Britain's Minister of Colonies, Cecil Rhodes, uh, Cecil Rhodes, seeking support for the Zionist settler colonial project in Palestine in 1902, uh, uh, Herzl wrote uh, to Rhodes stating, you are being invited to make uh, to help make history. It doesn't involve Africa, but a piece of Asia Minor, not Englishmen, but Jews. Uh, how then do I happen to turn to you since this is an out of the way matter for you? How indeed? Because it is something colonial. So Herzl himself and the early Zionists, uh, including all the way up to the 1930s and afterward, uh, understood the project in Palestine to be a colonial project uh, that would require uh, a either a replacement or pushing of the population, but for sure settling and taking over an existing inhabited land. Uh, the more important part of uh, putting the project 
in uh, action is the Belfort Declaration, as we all know. Uh, and with the Belfort Declaration, one, na one nation solemnly promised to a second nation, the country of a third, which is the absurdity of the Belfort Declaration. Uh, and this is uh, Arthur Kessler, Zionist author and journalist. And uh, Herzl's diary, no need to worry that homeland had been inserted instead of state. The Jewish people will read it as Jewish state anyhow, which means that the language that the Belfort Declaration used uh, was intentionally to use vague language uh, as such in order to make it possible uh, for the uh, development of uh, Zionism and incubating a settler colonial project in Palestine. At the time of the Belfort Declaration, uh, only 3% of the Palestine population uh, was Jewish and uh, uh, almost half of or less of that being Zionist, uh, meaning that there were Palestinian Jews that were in Palestine that they did not recognize or consider themselves to be Zionists. <clears throat> so the Belfort Declaration, uh, there are actually stages to it, pre-declaration period, interest that brought the declaration to life, the six different drafts, uh, League of Nation mandate that incorporated the Belfort Declarations, and then the consequences of uh, this declaration. I refer to the Belfort Declaration as colonial legalism, uh, that uh, make it possible to actually uh, uh, dispossess the population. And it says, His Majesty's government to view with, fav with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Now notice in here that uh, uh, the language of the Belfort Declaration actually does a complete erasure of 97% of the population, which is the Palestinians. That the only mark of identity that is given to them uh, in here is that they are not non-Jewish. Uh, so 97%, the majority population, the owners of the land, the inhabitants are described by non-Jewish communities. The second glaring part, it is actually says that, uh, that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of the existing non-Jewish population. And as we know, uh, civil and religious rights are meaningless if there is no political rights uh, over encompassing them. Uh, yet, when it comes to the Jewish communities, not only that they are given the status of a homeland in Palestine, a political, a national, meaning that they're given a national identity here, but also that the political rights uh, of and status of Jews outside of Palestine is likewise uh, need to be protected and recognized. So in this sense, it's actually uh, almost uh, grants a protection both inside as well as outside Palestine to the Jewish Zionist population uh, while denying that same status uh, of political rights and uh, national recognitions of the Palestinians. So the Belfort Declaration is uh, really 68 words of colonial dispossession that remove the Palestinians from the political landscape and make them into a colonized population. And this has to get us into the age of colonization. Uh, 85% uh, of world surface was a colony uh, if you looked at the world in 1914. Uh, Europe's colonizations informed Zionism, uh, meaning that rather than think of Zionism as a, a one-off in terms of European discourse, it's actually very much a Eurocentric, uh, constitutive uh, ideology using uh, uh, nationalism, and also using uh, Eurocentric uh, hegemonic power uh, to dispossess indigenous populations. And 
if you look at countries that have been under European controls, you see much of the world and Palestine is not an exception. I say this because often it's, uh, you speak to Zionists or Zionists who try to speak to you, uh, try to make that Palestine is such a difficult issue. Uh, they make it as difficult as possibly nuclear physics or uh, you know, uh, fuzzy math. There is nothing complicated or fuzzy about settler colonization. That, uh, we clearly understand it in the United States. We understand it in relations to Africa. We understand it in relations to Asia. But trying to cast a mysteriousness to it, as well as trying to uh, label any engagement of discourse on Palestine as a form of anti-Semitism, is basically to try to silence the debate and silence the discussion, and to frame it rather than being a settler colonial project, is to frame it in anything but a settler colonial project. So we need just to understand the public uh, discourses that are uh, uh, taking place. And in essence, it's discourses to obfuscate rather than to explain. It is to divert rather than to, uh, to account for what's happening. And more importantly, is to move uh, responsibility uh, from Zionism and uh, the creation of Israel that was on the back of dispossessing the indigenous Palestinians. So Herzl himself, he uh, viewed the Balfour Declaration, uh, say, let the sovereignty be granted us over a portion of the globe large enough to satisfy the rightful requirements of a nation. The rest we shall manage for ourselves. So even though that his statement is pre-Balfour Declaration, uh, Herzl was seeking a, a grant of sovereignty by a European power. Uh, in essence, a home in Palestine secured by public law. And as such, we still are contending in Palestine with the enforceability of the Balfour Declaration. Uh, as you're studying law, uh, law is, itself is born out of social, political, economic, and religious conditions. And much of the international body, international law, or the body of international law, has been shaped by colonization. Uh, Palestine is not an exception. Uh, it actually represents the norm. If you study, uh, even today, we have many of our colleagues in South Africa that are still attempting to undo uh, the ravages of uh, settler colonization in South Africa, uh, where the uh, last settler colonial project in Africa was the one in South Africa to be uh, undone with the release of Nelson Mandela and his uh, taking into the presidency. But the work of undoing the legal framework, the, the land rights, uh, the economic rights, the uh, uh, racial uh, uh, structure of housing and where the various homelands that were set up, that's gonna take a considerable period of time. And as such, Herzl understood that once you secure uh, a right by public law, especially by colonial public law, uh, the road toward uh, transforming it into facts on the ground is just a matter of time, which is essentially what uh, Zionism and Israel has done. So a land without a people for a people without a land is what we uh, constantly uh, understand. Theodore Herzl was the founder of modern Zionism. He advocated mass Jewish immigration to Palestine. Herzl, Herzl initially did not consider the indigenous people. When he realized they existed, he advocated transferring them. And he said, we shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in transient countries while denying it employment in our country. The property owners will come over to our side. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. Now this gets us at uh, really an important aspect relative to uh, Zionism as a type of colonization. Zionism is a settler colonial project. Uh, and we could distinguish between settler colonial project and motherland or motherland satellite colonies like uh, the, the Great Britain uh, that was a uh, settler colonial state and uh, implemented or founded 
uh, colonies across the world, uh, but it maintained that it's benefit to the motherland. Settler colonies uh, attempts to replace the population, uh, expropriate and takes over the land and often engages in either genocide or transfer. Uh, if we can use the United States as an example of the settler colonial type, uh, the indigenous population was put to uh, total genocide or uh, overwhelming genocide. Uh, now the total Native American population that is left in the United States is about 6.7 million, which makes less than two and a half to 2.8% of the population. Uh, so there were a genocide and then the remaining population were actually pushed into what we call reservations. Uh, same model in South Africa, uh, a genocide that was committed not only in South Africa, but Southern Africa with uh, King Leopold II of uh, Belgium, uh, which at, at a certain point uh, from uh, the Belgium con uh, colonization of the Congo and trying to formulate a, settle, a settler society in there, 50% uh, of the population was put to genocide, uh, close to 8 million uh, plus. And then the rest of the population in South Africa in particular were actually pushed into what's called the black homelands a form of reservations. And then the best lands, the best agricultural land, the coastal lands, all that were taken by uh, the settlers. So when we think about the uh, Zionist project in Palestine, it very much uh, follows the same contours of the settler colonial type. Uh, Palestinians were put into a genocide and transfer, genocide of the 1948, uh, for uh, some 561 villages were completely wiped out. Uh, eight urban centers uh, emptied of its population, about 120 uh, massacres, uh, 20 large massacres, and then others are smaller massacres that caused the uh, flight of the Palestinians, and then uh, uh, continued with the process of uh, ethnic cleansing and transfer in order to uh, bring about a demographically designed state, which gets into another uh, component of settler uh, colonialism, it's preoccupation with demographics. Um, it's a preoccupation of Israel, it's a preoccupation of uh, many who uh, formulate policy, and that gets you into the sense of Israel policy inside uh, not only 48, but 67, uh, frustrating Palestinian normative development pattern uh, in such a way that forces the Palestinians either to uh, leave or uh, to cause them constant entanglement with the legal uh, uh, system, the military legal system. Uh, so you take in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, almost 800,000 Palestinians have been through Israeli prisons. Uh, somewhat uh, one uh, from, uh, from one to four or one to three, meaning uh, 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 almost 40% of the Palestinian population uh, have been funneled through the Israeli prisons in one way or the other. Uh, interestingly enough, it, uh, it actually hovers a little bit above uh, the same type of percentage that we find in relations to both um, Black Americans, as well as Native Americans in terms of the utilization of the prison uh, system or the prison industrial system as a mode of control, uh, as a way to bring about a transfer or a movement uh, away from uh, the territories or the land that, has, uh, that is controlled or owned by the indigenous population. So a land without a people for a people without a land the land has been made to be emptied of its indigenous population in the same way uh, that the Americas were emptied uh, by means of genocide of the indigenous populations. Uh, so the Balfour Declaration again went through a number of drafts. Uh, so I am not gonna belabor the points in here, but uh, the idea that uh, Great Britain just issued a, a declaration of its own uh, should be dispensed with, rather it was a negotiations back and forth until uh, the text uh, that uh, dispossessed the Palestinians uh, was put in place. Now, an important historical fact uh, 
Uh, Great Britain control of Palestine occurred uh, between December 10th and the 12th uh, of 1948. Yet the Belfort Declaration actually uh, was issued on November 2nd, 19, uh, 1917. Actually, no, uh, December 10th to the 12th, 1917, uh, the, uh, the Belfort Declaration was issued on November 2nd, 1917. And as again, uh, from a legal perspective, both international law and regular law in general, uh, Great Britain gave a territory that it did not have rightful title or even colonial control uh, over at the time of issuing the Belfort Declaration. And the more important is that the declaration itself was issued to a private prop, uh, to a private uh, agent, meaning the uh, Arthur Rothschild, who was in uh, in Europe, uh, in either in Switzerland or France at the time, uh, being delivered to him in a form of a letter. Uh, so from a legal perspective, he had no standing to receive a territory that did not belong to the British, even by rights of uh, colonial possessions or even rights of conquest, uh, because it was even a month uh, and eight days before the British under General Lemby uh, arrived in Palestine. Now, the declaration itself uh, was incorporated into the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Uh, the right was, recog was recognized in the Belfort Declaration of the 2nd of November and reaffirmed in the mandate of the League of Nations, which in particular gave international sanction to the historic connection. All right, so even in the declaration, it says historic connection, not historic right. Very important distinction between the Jewish people and uh, greater Israel and the right of the Jewish people to rebuild its national home. Uh, so this becomes why it's so critical to critique uh, the Belfort Declaration and critique uh, uh, Great Britain. I always maintain that Palestine was colonized uh, and this possessed uh, beginning with the British colonial occupation in 1917. The 1948 Nakba is basically is shifting between from the British as the hegemonic colonial power into the Zionist settler colonial uh, power. So we shifted from a colonization with a motherland satellite in terms of Great Britain, and then shifting into uh, settler colonization during uh, the uh, Nakba and post Nakba all the way up uh, to the present. So uh, uh, Belfort, this is Lord Corazon, uh, in terms of both uh, considering that Palestine was inhabited, which as you often debate these Zionists uh, who possibly don't know their head from their toes, but that's a side issue. They say there is no such thing as Palestine or that uh, uh, Palestine was uninhabited. All this, uh, what I consider to be nonsense and obfuscation. Uh, Lord Corazon says, in Palestine, we do not propose even to go through the form of consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants of the country. Uh, the four great powers are committed to Zionism. And Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is rooted in age-long traditions, in present need, in future hopes, of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. In short, so far as Palestine is concerned, the powers have, have made no statement of fact, which is not admittedly wrong, and no declaration of policy, which at least in the letter, they have not always intended to violate, meaning uh, promising any type of recognition for Palestinian rights. So this is again, get us into the understanding of colonial discourses of Zionism. So Belfort Declaration is colonial legalism. The Belfort Declaration is type of colonialism seeking, seeking dishonestly, in, is reeking in this dishonestly in each word used for its sole purpose is to provide a cover for the outright civilized thievery of Palestine from its indigenous uh, population. So dating the Nakba, so the Nakba begins with the British mandate, uh, British mandate policy, 1917, 1948, which should be thought of and considered 
as a new version of colonization uh, during that era. It facilitates Zionist immigration and settlement of Palestine. So we get from 1917 to 1948 from a 3% to 35%, allowing incubating uh, the Zionist project. Uh, so in essence, Zionism was the junior colonial partner of Great Britain. Oppressing Palestinians, uprising and closing eyes or encouraging underground Zionist militias, the Ergen, Haganah and others, uh, in a similar way that we see today with the Zionist violence that, has, that continues to be committed against the Palestinians. Uh, economic empowerment for Zionist settlers in Palestine, almost every major project in Palestine during the British uh, uh, mandate period was handed uh, to uh, the Zionists uh, to operate and also facilitating uh, various loans and uh, facility to them. Uh, and then the British early withdrawal without a political settlement to uh, the crisis in Palestine. Uh, I often say that Palestinians uh, are facing uh, Zionist, colonize, Zionist settler colonization, Western hegemonic uh, 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 colonization and post-colonization, which views Zionism as a success story and narrative from Eurocentric lens uh, that also uh, uh, sees the ground from their theological point of view uh, of the preparation for the second coming. It's not surprising uh, that when the British entered into Palestine, uh, then British newspapers, as well as even before that, it framed uh, the uh, arrival in Palestine in uh, crusaders terminology that the uh, British press uh, says uh, uh, the crusades come to an end after 632 years of Muslim rule. And there is a narrative where the French also made it all the way to Syria visiting uh, the grave of Salah al-Din and saying, oh, Salah al-Din, here we came back. Uh, so one cannot separate this notion of irredentism, uh, of Western, uh, uh, Western powers and Western society that views uh, both Palestine and the Holy Land, and more importantly, the East in general, as their rightful birthright, because it constitutes one of the important tab roots for Western civilization. The other is the city state of um, Athens and Rome that constitute the second, but the tab root of, of uh, Christian uh, identity is framed around it. And the notion of uh, who lost the Holy Land and why the population in this region have converted to Islam is still one of those elements that is vexing to Western uh, Eurocentric uh, uh, framing and as such retrieving the Holy Land is retrieving one of those uh, lost pillars uh, in there. So one has to always think on those terms and increasingly we could see this type of language is being used and uh, articulated as such. Uh, so that's how we at least uh, understand the, uh, the Nakba and what the Palestinians have faced. So I'm going to stop in here and actually give you maybe the opportunity to ask questions so it doesn't end up being a one directional uh, discussion. So I'm open to any and all questions that you have, and then we could, uh, you know, delve in other items of the conversation. I had a question. Um, just regarding the Belfour X, the drafts, uh, did they have the other suggestions of where Israel was going to be located. No, by was this time, the that the by this time that the discussions and debate was only focused on Palestine. We're talking about uh, there was a debate in 1902 and another debate in 1909 whether to take other locations, uh, whether it's in uh, West Africa. Argentina was thought of, in essence, uh, approaching the British for uh, another locations. By the time we get into 1917 that the World Zionist Organization have already voted to focus on Palestine as the location. So an earlier discussions was in the beginning part of the 1900s. Okay, um, and outside, what was the, was the main reason for focusing on Palestine for land was the religious significance 
or like the like the religious claim to it was that the reason well i think for the zionists that there is when the, the Zionists are secular, they actually wanted, uh, you could also evaluate that Zionism is a, a reform movement away from the religious uh, uh, hold of traditional Orthodox Judaism that uh, was run through the rabbinical institution. Uh, so they were focusing on a sec secular discourse. Uh, their discussion is that it is much more appeal of trying to rally Jewish support uh, for the Zionist project, uh, opposite trying to get it, let's say, to Kenya or Chad or Argentina. So there is that aspect. But I think a much more important element is that in here, Zionist desire for a, for a colony met British interest in Palestine as a buffer state to protect Egypt and the Suez Canal. So in here, the British were actually uh, thinking they could strike two birds with one stone. On the one hand, uh, uh, by this time in the late 19th, 19th century, era 20th century, Great Britain had an intense anti-Semitic fervor. Uh, even Balfour himself was an avid anti-Semite. The second is that the Great Britain was in the hub of what's called the great game with Russia over uh, Afghanistan, which Afghanistan is still with us in the news. Uh, uh, great Britain was in India. India was the most important colony for Great Britain. It was considered to be the crown jewel of uh, Great Britain's colonial possessions. And literally the, the crown jewels were stolen from India. <laughs> Uh, worth billions. Uh, Great Britain extracted out of India about $45 trillion worth of uh, material support and wealth. When the British entered India, India used to be about between 22 to 27% of the global economy. When the British left India, they reduced it to 4% of the global economy. So when you go and visit the British Museum, you should while appreciating it, you're dealing with what you call, we have Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. The British Museum is the 40 Thieves and Alibaba is in Guantanamo Bay, right? <laughs> so most of the British trade from India was passing through the Suez Canal. Uh, in opposite to uh, uh, India, India was protected on the north by a mountainous region, which is the Hindu Kush and Afghanistan. So it's very difficult for an invasion to threaten the North. And that's why British were always engaged in Afghanistan uh, as the means of protection to their uh, colony, uh, India. Egypt was a colony to Great Britain beginning, beginning as early as 1805, uh, being indirectly behind uh, Muhammad Ali's throne, but taking direct control in 1882. And the Suez Canal was opened in 1869. Uh, which almost one third of the global trade was passing through the Suez Canal, uh, predominantly British uh, trade from India, from the coastal region, from the Persian Gulf, from uh, Yemen, uh, from uh, uh, East Africa. Uh, so Egypt is a very flat land on both sides of the canal. And the British were worried that the Ottoman would be able to come down from the north and possibly take over uh, the canal, or even the Russians coming through the, uh, uh, what is it, uh, through the Bosphorus, uh, through the Black Sea, the Bosphorus, and then be able to attack the Suez Canal as a count as a counterbalance. So they thought creating a buffer state in Palestine uh, that would be uh, inhabited by the Zionists, who would always need. Uh, Europe and Great Britain support to maintain control and thus they will have an interest in protecting British, British interests in the region. So the British were in essence looking at their own self-interest. So that maybe also uh, facilitated why Palestine was selected. And by the time we get to the Balfour Declaration, it was a marriage of convenience, more like shotgun wedding, but uh, who's uh, speaking. 
And that's essentially how we get into Palestine being the location for uh, the Zionists. Okay, it seems like it's the same process now in terms of outside of the British, the Britain, Great Britain, now the U.S. having an interest to be there. Just sort of the, yeah, the uh, U.S. Economy, yeah. U.S. is interested in oil. That's the only thing is inter interested, and then also markets in the Middle East for its finished products. Uh, those are the two dominant uh, narrative, and Israel provide an advanced uh, military uh, state that continue to be the regional hegemonic power to monitor and to uh, create a balance among the existing powers in the region. Okay. I had another question. Um, I don't think it was in the PowerPoint, but I remember reading regarding, I forget which, uh, not declaration, but the um, United Nations at first had Zionism as they considered it racism, but then later it was changed. Uh, do you know that what was the Reason that assume. was a 1973. There was an adoption of a resolution in the United Nations. This is at the height of the push during the uh, uh, anti-colonial period. This is also the, the uh, introduction of the uh, uh, movement uh, against South Africa apartheid, that uh, there's a convention that was adopted by the United Nations and one resolution equated saying that Zionism is a form, is a form of racism. And then that's when I was 1973 uh, period, post 1973. When Yasser Arafat and the PLO signed uh, the Oslo Peace Treaty, uh, committing one of the most, uh, I would say, uh, major blunders, that is, was the requirement for them to go back to the United Nations and to call for undoing these resolutions, which was a, a level of stupidity that I can't even grade it. You know, there's there's like an F stupidity, and then there is like below F. This was a below F uh, step uh, because Zionism did not change for you to actually uh, call for this change, nor you got a state uh, for this because usually when state finish their whatever peace treaty and so on, and there is an end of hostilities, then they, what you call, go back to normalization. In here, the PLO was... Uh, only for it to be recognized to negotiate, undone the body of international law that would have supported the Palestinians' position. So that's where the calamity that we are in right now, that Israel got everything uh, from the Palestinians by Yasser Arafat's signature. And all what we got is the Palestinian Authority, which is the right to govern over the pa occupied Palestinians and to protect the settlers from Palestinians. That's basically what you have. Uh, I've got one more question. So uh, this, I've spoken about Palestine to other students, and well, let, let, there's let's say there's like there's there would be one person in particular who might say that uh, uh, the land was bought by investors, and that's how they got the land. And I mean that's just a you know a myth. And but what are some other myths that you've seen perpetuated, and what are some ways to kind of dispel them. Well, we made the desert bloom, right? That Israel or Zionist ingenuity, creativity uh, made the desert into the lush land that is there. And that's usually, it's used also in native, toward Native Americans, that this was a barren land and European know-how and ingenuity uh, built this country. They don't tell you that we polluted all the waters, that some rivers you can swim in it, some lakes are the fish are turning right, you know, over there. And this, this past two days ago, we just had a, a massive oil uh, right in Huntington Beach. So no, you no longer can actually, what you call, uh, go into the water or uh, windsurf if you're into windsurfing, right? But that's a strong, because in essence, it's saying it has, if you read um, the work of Albert Mimi, the colonizer and the colonizer, or uh, Wretched of the Earth by, uh, uh, Franz Fanon, it, it is a common theme to try to say that uh, they did not know the value of what the land that they have, and it is only through us that we have made this land bloom and develop. So that's a powerful, uh, what you call, it's actually linking to the same logic of the United States 
you know, in relations to the indigenous population. So, you know, you have to know where these themes and why they're activated as such in there. The other part is that is constantly saying that uh, we are returning to our homeland. So this is activating the biblical narrative. And sometimes it becomes a problem that Palestinians entering into the biblical narrative, you get lost. Uh, because in essence, you'll get into the realm of theology and you know, theology has no real, what you call uh, uh, definitive answer on many of these speculative issues. Uh, rather, you should focus that this is a settler colonial project uh, and God did not actually communicate with anyone to authorize for you to dispossess and throw peoples out. Uh, so we have to always be very careful while you know, being Muslim and want to engage in what you call religious discussions, that that religious discussion you're on slippery slope, especially because you're dealing with a whole notion of Judeo Christians, mostly Christian. The Judea was only at, added on post Second World War and even all the past 40 years. So you're dealing with a very slippery slope that you're trying to really uh, address yourself to the whole biblical narrative in order to discuss Palestine and Palestinians. So I, I would say to be worry, worry uh, of that. Uh, the last issue that we always have to confront is the violence, right? Uh, the Palestinians are violent. And these days is basically every, every other word of the people that you talk to, the Zionists, is either Hamas or Hummus, you determine. So transforming the discussions is like Hamas, Hamas, and then they slip into Hummus. And in essence, to try to basically say that the Palestinians are the violent one, and we're our own defending ourselves. Again, the same logic of colonization is always there. The French said that the Algerians are the violent ones. The United States said Vietnamese are the violent ones. In the Americas, the indigenous people are the violent ones. Every colonial power have projected the violent nature to the people it colonized in order to legitimize its elimination. So again, uh, I always say, if somebody say, ask me about it, I say, I say, if you are a Gandhian, I could have a discussion with you about violence and violence, but some of these people served in the Israeli army, and then they want to come and actually uh, talk to you about violence of the Palestinian. They themselves have served in the Israeli military, served in the West Bank and shot on Palestinians, yet they want to actually reverse in order to blame the victim, the fact that they are being victimized. So we need to be aware of about these, what I consider be tropes that are used. Uh, yes, uh, I do have a question. Um, so nowadays we have the Zionism normalization uh, and even in the Muslim uh, mosque and in inter under the so-called interfaith. And a lot of time when we address them, they will say, we don't want to get political. This is something and this is something, you know, or it's overseas. How do you address um, this kind of issue or what's the best way to address it um, with our community? I think you need to address it by always putting programs and organizing uh, a counter narrative in there to make sure that you are highlighting what the Palestine struggle is all about. That's one. Second, uh, that the Zionists are working with a strategy of divide and rule, meaning that they want to create the divisions in the Muslim community and their strategy is what they call to isolate the hardcore support for Palestine from the soft support of Palestine in the Muslim community. And in this sense, to peel out the strategy that they used in relations to the Black Panther Party during the 1960s. You isolate what you call the Black Panther Party, the Bobby Seale, the uh, Huey Newton, the uh, um, uh, Fred Hampton from the broader uh, community. And in such a way, you could say, these are the troublemakers and these are the good people. So we need to make sure that in doing our work that we don't fall into their strategy, in essence, becoming the tools for making the divisions and the, the divide and conquer uh, being there. This does not mean we should not uh, confront and address people who are engaging this, but addressing them, I would say that it should not be brought into a battle in the mosque or a battle in the center, because what happened is that it actually creates uh, a very fragment, fragmented uh, space. And in that fragmented space, I say people will tend to choose the road of least resistance. And therefore they actually 
will peel away from you in the long run. So there has to be some clear strategy of what we need. Lastly, always attack the main target. Don't go for the secondary target. What they're trying to do is create a secondary target, meaning creating a Muslim target. So you end up being preoccupied with the secondary target and you miss the main target, which is Zionism and Zionism and Zionism and its partnership with the hegemonic uh, Eurocentric colonial powers. So uh, undoing a strategy does not mean that you need to accept the strategy, it's that you need to be aware of what is they're attempting to accomplish so you would not actually become a fulfillment for it. I just have like one last question. I know we have like a few have more five minutes. minutes. <laughs> um, but um, with the law of return, I read an article a couple of days ago about some South Africans, like the Dutch descendants of converting to Judaism and then moving to Palestine. Um, yeah. Could you just want your thoughts over it, just that whole process of converting but and then being allowed to return? You remember I said that uh, settler colonialism is always preoccupied with demographics. And therefore, Israel has always recruited new population to immigrate to Israel whether they are converting to Judaism or in the case of Russians, they just brought them in and basically created Judaization strategy culturally and so on, whether you are converted or not, as long as you prescribe to the settler colonial imperative. Uh, some estimates say that 50% of the uh, Russian immigrants to Palestine were not of non-Jewish background, but yet they were incorporated as being Jewish immigrants uh, to uh, to Israel, and some have used that as an avenue to enter into the United States because there is an easy immigration pipeline and a green card to the United States. So demographics makes it possible for Israel to situate itself with populations that wants to uh, immigrate for whatever reason. So, for example, you'll have uh, uh, the South African uh, Africana who, after losing quote, uh, I don't, even the question, the concept of losing is like, you did not have it to lose it, but the fact that they no longer are master race, they needed to uh, get out of South Africa. So they opted to actually re-maintain their supremacist view by moving to Israel and, and expressing their supremacy toward the Palestinians, right? In relations to the Russians, this is a population that uh, Israel wanted to change. The demographics of Palestinian numbers were increasing. So bringing a million Russians, changing demographically and maintain support, superior uh, demographic uh, uh, position for uh, the Zionists in Israel. Uh, so you'll find these dynamics taking place. The key is maintaining demographic superiority for the Zionist components of Palestine. So that's what you are seeing, whether in South Africa, Russia, or other places. Okay, and just with the aspect of uh, them adopting Judaism, is it still primarily favored towards just Europeans? Because I would assume, like, I know there are like indigenous, like Jews in the region, but how? Well, when we talk about Israel, Israel is firmly structured around the racial matrix. Meaning at the top, the racial, racial matrix is white uh, European Jewish population. And then below it is Eastern Jewish population. Then you get into uh, what's called Sephardic, which is uh, Eastern Jewish population. And then below that, you get the uh, uh, black Jewish population from Ethiopia and possibly also Yemen. And then below that, you get the Palestinian uh, uh, Druze. And below the Druze, you get the Christian Palestinians. And below the Christian Palestinians, you get the Muslim Palestinians. And then the last is the Bedouins. So that's the racial matrix that is operable. I have a um, uh, last question, please. Um, so uh, do, do you have a data um, about the Zionist organization in US, how they support the occupation over there? Um, do we have a data on that? What kind of work to promote Islamophobia um, as well in US? Well, we have some data, how comprehensive it is. It's not there, but uh, 
uh, aside from the United States government, which is a major supporter of Zionism, close to 3.5, maybe right now it's going to be $4 billion, then all of the uh, Zionist organizations that are tax deductible. So you have to go organization by organization, including uh, friends of the IDF, friends of the Israeli Defense Force, where people you could actually donate and your donations are tax deductible. Uh, then you have all of the Christian evangelicals that all have a pal uh, an Israel project, whether it's uh, funding, uh, supporting settlements, uh, uh, organizing trips, all that feeds into a rough, rough estimate, uh, I would say uh, between nine to $11 billion a year annually is funneled from direct US aid to all types of materials, all types of donations, so on, is, goes to Israel uh, from the United States. Then you get into supporting of Islamophobic organizations and we have about 115 different Islamophobic organizations. Big segment of it is pro-Israel, including uh, Daniel Pipes, Middle East, Wa uh, Middle East Forum. You have the uh, Canvas Watch from David Horowitz. Uh, pajama uh, media from uh, uh, what's her name uh, Pamela Geller uh, you have uh, Frank Gaffney Center for Strategic Studies you have Stephen Emerson uh, the uh, investigative project on terrorism all these are at the hub of the Islamophobic discourse because demonizing Muslims in order to to push them away from engaging in civil society and thus allowing only Israel voice and Israel supporters to have their say in public discourse. So that's the, at least the strategy of why Islamophobia is utilized in order to say that the voice of Muslims and voice of Palestinians is to be shifted and pushed to the side because if there is, if there is only one voice, which is Israel voice and its supporters, then there is no debate. So at the core of it, they actually uh, do not want to debate the issue because they facts are not on their side. Uh, justice is not on their side. Ethics is not on their side. And morality on their side is not on their side. So the best way to debate is to actually not to have a debate. Or if you want to have a debate, is just bring one of the most distorted, what you call straw man arguments, terrorism, 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 Hamas, Hamas, Hamas. And again, it's the discourse of, I call it hummus and falafel discourse, where you actually are all producing what you call empty air. And that's how you maintain support for Israel uncontested. Okay, um, I wanna thank you again for taking the time out of your day to um, and have this discussion with us. Um, inshallah, we'll have more events and, and hopefully we'll be able to give in more narrow topics um, and probably better time because I know it's 3 p.m. It's kind of hard for people and it's right before uh, midterms. Um, but yeah, I just want to tell you thank you again. Thank you. Next time, inshallah. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Hatem. Dr. Hatem, do you know um, Do you know where we learn about, like, do you have a website or we can read more about it? Well, you could read that. Yeah, you have the link and then you also, I have uh, my book, Palestine is Something Colonial. You could... Uh, you know, access it, uh, and I have a lot of a large number of articles as well on the subject. I placed it in the group in the chat, um, just a link to his website and the focus on race, but they'll show everything goes as well. Thank yeah. you, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, salam alaikum. <laughs> I have to go and bother students myself. <laughs>